Hello and welcome to Dark Horror Diaries. Tonight we're gonna talk about few creepy Craigslist horror stories. This happened in the fall of 2014. I was 20 and recently widowed thanks to cancer. I was living with my parents again and was looking to get back out on my own. I had found roommates in the past from Craigslist and it wasn't a problem for me. I never met any weirdos or anything. This time was a bit different. I met a guy we'll call Andrew. We texted for a few days and he seemed normal. We even exchanged pics just for peace of mind. We decided to meet up. And he told me he didn't have a car. Red flag. How are you going to move out without a car? We don't live in a city with a very good bus line. And it just seemed off to me. So stupid me decides to pick him up later that day. He lived in the next town over. And we were just going to go to McDonald's. And get to know each other. At 8 p.m. I start making my way to his house. Which I come to find is in a trailer park. I finally found the right one. And he comes and gets in my car. Just looks like a normal 18-year-old kid. Except he looked younger in my opinion. Like 16, 17 he was Hispanic and not bad looking. He did seem fidgety though. We get to McDonald's and I'm like. So should we go into which she replies with. Let's just sit in the parking lot. I found this odd but whatever. We sit and chat and kind of get to know each other. I find out he works in the next town over. Keep in mind, that is now to towns away from where I wanted to move. And he has no car he says it won't be a problem. He starts looking around him as if he's super nervous. He asks about my dating life. And this is where it gets odd. I tell him about my husband. And he asks if I consider dating him. So we could get a one bedroom. He keeps talking about how I can cook for him. And be his girl. At this point alarm bells are ringing. But I keep my cool and laugh along saying hey. You never know what could happen. I tell him I need to go home because it's getting late. I take him back home and we part ways without incident. He texted the next day but I never replied. So that's my creepy Craigslist story. I probably won't use it to find any more roommates. Ex-girlfriend got scammed on Craigslist. Selling her iPhone some kid gave her $400 in fake cash. Then took her phone and ran. We argue over X drops fake cash in my car door panel. Break up with her a few weeks later. Fast forward one year I get pulled over from my tire. Touching the double yellow while passing a vehicle. Stopped on the shoulder. Sheriff thinks it's odd I'm wearing sandals in November. Asks me to exit vehicle and asks to search it. I agree. Cops find cash detain me and tow car for $240. They take me to station without giving me a reason. I'm questioned for four hours while handcuffed to a bench. Told my story is ridiculous and an outright lie. 
they continue to formulate stories they find plausible. Trying to get me to admit guilt. Power for of interrogation. They decide to check police reports and are able to corroborate my story. Since the same person ripped off more than 20 people in the same time period, using bills with the same serial numbers. Cops upset they got the wrong guy. Drive me home no apology. Oh by the way, you'll have to pick up your car tomorrow for $240. Have a nice life and... That's the story of how I completely lost all respect. For the county sheriff's office. Because of incompetence and Craigslist scammers. So over the last seven months, I've been working for someone I responded to on Craigslist. Well, I'll just explain everything. This seems like an appropriate place to post this. I was scouring the internet for some sort of pain gig. I didn't really care what. Then I came across a post on Craigslist. I had just refreshed the page, and there was. Someone was looking for a person to come by and feed their pets. I assumed they were going out of town or something. So I contacted them and left my number through email. I got a response immediately in the form of a phone call. The caller was a man who explained to me that he was moving out of town and his parents had cats they wanted fed daily. I gave the man my name so he could run me through a grocery background check. And in about 20 minutes I was hired. I went there the next morning to get all the instructions and whatnot and met the man I'd spoken to on the phone. His name was Ben. Ben explained to me that he would no longer be able to care for his parents' cats and that his parents needed to focus on themselves. So, I was being brought on to take care of that. The money would be left on the kitchen table at the end of every week. Dollar two hundred a week just to feed some cats. I know right. In addition to that, Money for more cat food would be left for me as needed. Then he told me the first thing that I thought was strange. I was to come at exactly 10 a.m. every day and be gone by 10. 10 a.m. And I was to never under any circumstances. To interact with his parents. He told me that when I'm in their home. They will be in their chairs in the living room watching television and that I was not to disturb them ever. He asked if any of that would be a problem to which I assured him it wouldn't. He then showed me the area in which the cats eat. There were four cats and where the food was kept. While not rude in the least, he was very adamant that I not explore further in the house which I promised him wouldn't be a problem. He ushered me outside and showed me where the spare key was in case the door was ever locked. But he told me that was very unlikely to happen. And with that, he expressed his hope that I could be trusted. One last time, shook my hand and told me to be there at 10. Am every day starting tomorrow if I was ever unable to make it. Call and leave a message on their home phone. To which he gave me the number. I shook my head and was on my way. The next day came and I went inside at exactly 10 a. M. I walked into the house. And immediately to my right were Ben's parents. Sitting in recliners facing away from me. 
watching some kind of game show. I announced my presence which they ignored and made my way to the kitchen. I fed the cat's bowls and left. This exact same scenario played out countless times over the next few months. 10 a.m. Unreturned hello. Feed the cats leave. On Fridays I would pick up the small stack of $20 bills from the kitchen table. It was the easiest job I ever had. Then came the inevitable one day I was running late. I got to the house at 10.08. I entered and apologized to Ben's parents for being late. To which I once again got no response. They just kept sitting in their chairs, watching their game show. I went to the kitchen and fed the cats. I looked at my phone which read 1011 and walked down the hall towards the front door. When I reached the living room, I jumped and gasped out of shock. Ben's parents were now standing in the dark, behind their chairs completely still, staring directly at me. I apologized for running late and got out of there. Though unnerved I went back the next day on time. And everything was fine. A few more months went by of nothing strange. And then came the last day I was there. I got there at 10.03 but wasn't worried. Because I knew I could be out before 10.10. The problem came when I was in the kitchen. And I heard someone whisper the words. Help me it startled me and I jumped. Looking around for the source of the cry for help. I saw no one around but I heard it again. And then a third time I began looking around. Before realizing I was running behind. I looked at my phone and it was 10.10. My heart sank to my stomach. When I looked down the hallway and saw Ben's parents. For the first time in the light. They were grossly emaciated and pale. Looking completely malnourished. They were essentially walking skeletons. I apologized for taking so long. And said I'd be on my way. But they just stood there. Blocking the way to the front door. I said I would take the back door. Which was located in the kitchen. But when I went to open it, I found that it required a key to open from the inside. Seriously, it was at this point that true panic set in. I looked behind me and the parents were now about a half a foot away from the entrance to the kitchen. And I had nowhere else to go, except what I presumed was a door to a pantry. They had blank stares across their faces. And their eyes looked as if the life had left them. A long time ago. And a last ditch effort. I went to the door that I thought was the pantry. And was instead met with a staircase. Leading into a basement with. Of course no light. As soon as I opened the door. There was a horrid stench that washed over the. Otherwise clean air I was standing in. I carefully went down the stairs and looked. For a window but they were all nailed shut. I happened to look back up the stairs. And the parents were now standing next to each other. At the top of the stairs it was truly horrifying. I pulled out my phone and called 911. Not knowing what else to do. And when I explained my situation, they said they would send a car out immediately and to stay on the phone while they connected me to the unit. En route, I ran into the dark basement using my phone as a light. It didn't provide too much illumination since I was in the middle of a call. 
but it was just enough. There were racks of junk that lined the basement, separating it into almost aisles. I went down, down to check if any of the windows were possibly loose. Like I'd be that lucky. Then I turned around and shined the light in front of me. And I was inches away from the parents. Lifeless looking faces. I let out a scream and ran in the other direction. And tripped over something. Sending my phone flying from my hand. Of course it landed face down so I couldn't find it. I ran back up the stairs and into the kitchen. Looking back and seeing the parents. Standing at the bottom of the stairs. With slight grins on their faces. I ran down the hall to the front door and find it open. Screaming, when I saw the cops standing right in front of me. He asked me if I was the one that called. As I pushed past him to get outside and told him I was. I looked in the window. And saw the parents sitting in their chairs. Watching their game show. I explained that these crazy. Old people had trapped me in their house. And were chasing me around. The cop went in to talk to the parents and look around. While I sat in the cop car. He came back out about five minutes later. And asked if I was sure someone was chasing me. I said yes I was absolutely sure that it was the two. Old people that lived there. He informed me that the people that lived there. People in the chairs have been dead for quite some time. I asked what the smell in the basement was. And he said there was another body down there. Backup showed up I gave them my statement. And explained how I've been coming there every day. For months and months to feed the cats. I told them to call Ben the homeowner's son. I gave them the number and it was disconnected. I found out a few days later that the body in the basement was Ben. What I don't get is who's been paying me. I just remembered this today. In the mid-90s my dad was really big on options. So he could resell stuff mostly estate or storage. Liquidations. I was a college student and lived away from home. But would humor him by joining him from time to time. This was before Craigslist was popular. Or any online selling platform really. So options at the time were very popular. I joined him to inspect an estate sale. That was apparently from a deceased man's home in San Francisco. The auction house was packed with stuff. And a ton of furniture. Since my dad was a big customer. He got to go to the pre-sale browses. Where he could inspect. Or make lists of what he was interested in. Before the auction. I was bored out of my mind. And was mindlessly. Opening and closing drawers of the furniture. There was one large armoire that was full of the owners. Personal items cancelled checks. Bills etc. Then I opened the bottom drawer. It was full of old blood stained lingerie. Not a little bit stained. Like completely covered in old brown blood. And crumpled up and stuffed in there. Most of it was white or light colored. So it was very obvious I slammed the drawer shut. Ran and got my father. He thought I was being dramatic and came to look at it. Upon seeing it, he looked alarmed and found the auction house owner. Very quickly five large, strong-looking men appeared in, very quietly and quickly, 
Remove the entire armoire off the floor. And into the back somewhere. I never found out anything further about it but I thought about it for a long time. I wish I had remembered the names on those cancelled checks and bills. But at the time I had much more on my mind. And cell phones didn't have cameras like they do now. Anyhow that's my creepy memory. A few days ago I started receiving tons of emails for signing up to various things online colleges, real estate porn, Hershey's etc. I was initially like okay, someone is angry and bored. Then I started getting spam calls and text messages for more random things. This started to concern me because I only use my number for emergencies and appointments it's a little Nokia flip phone. I have a smartphone but I just use it with Wi-Fi. Anyway I changed my number. It took about 30 seconds no big deal. The next day somebody knocked on my door and asked for Galen Harris. Why is this concerning you ask? That's the name of my grandfather. A man who sexually abused me every day for three years. When I was nine years old. A man currently missing for over a year. So taken aback and suddenly very anxious. I asked why you would ask for that name. There was a Craigslist ad for a free Xbox. With my address and it said to ask for Galen Harris. I explained to the man what he had just done. He apologized and left. My concern is that this unknown childish person had my email phone number and address. Most of my friends don't even have my address. Maybe five people total I have agoraphobia. And most of my social life happens in video games. I stay pretty detached from the world. I am worried this person is just getting started. And I have had enough trauma in my life. The police open a case. So that there is a record of the encounter. But without a name to pin this on. They can't really do anything. I'm not sure what to do. All I have to go on is an IP address. I have a cashier's check sitting on my kitchen table right now from a Craigslist listing. I'm trying to sell my dad's 12-foot boat with motor and trailer on Craigslist. I've had a few questions but no real no real hits on the ad yet up until last weekend. Someone contacted me through texting only said they lived out of the area and really wanted to vote. They would send me a cashier's check and have someone else pick up the boat for them. I got the check on Saturday. It is for $20,450 we. We asking $975 for the boat. He said to cash the check and give the difference to the person picking up the boat. Now I know that the check is not good and that nothing good would ever come from meeting up with someone that is trying to scam. But I am not sure what to do next. Should I take the check to the police? Should I just shred it all up any advice? The memories of high school are often colored by nostalgia. At time when we were young, K 
carefree and full of hope for the future. For my friend Jason, those days were particularly special. As he forged a bond with someone, who would become one of his best friends Emily. They had been inseparable during those years. Sharing laughter secrets and dreams. But his life moved forward. They drifted apart. Each embarking on their own unique journeys. Years passed. And it wasn't until they reached their late twenties. That their paths converged once again. Emily had just moved into a charming house. On the outskirts of the city. And she needed a new housemate to share the rent. She took to Craigslist to search for a suitable candidate. Hoping to find someone who would not only contribute their share of the bills, but also bring a positive atmosphere into the house. After sifting through countless responses and conducting interviews, Emily finally found her match, a woman named Sarah. Sarah's references checked out and she seemed cool. Friendly and responsible. Emily was overjoyed to have found a new housemate. And the two quickly became friends. For a while everything seemed to be falling into place. They would have late night chats. Watch movies and explore the city together. It felt like the perfect arrangement. However one evening. Their peaceful coexistence took a horrifying turn. Emily's phone buzzed incessantly, with messages from an unknown number. Alarmed she picked it up, only to find disturbing texts from a man she didn't recognize. The messages grew increasingly threatening and deranged, hinting at a past relationship that had taken a dark and obsessive turn. Emily showed them to Sarah, who was equally horrified. Sarah, or heart pounding, realized the identity of the sender. It was her ex-boyfriend Eric, whom she had broken up with years ago, due to his increasingly erratic and abusive behavior. She had hoped he would leave her alone. But it was clear that he hadn't forgotten her. His obsession had resurfaced. And he was convinced they were still a couple. Emily concerned for her friend's safety. Suggested contacting the police. But Sarah was reluctant to take such a step. She believed she could handle the situation on her own. Unaware of the danger that lurked. Unbeknownst to them, Eric was already planning his revenge. And the flames of his obsession burned brighter than ever. One fateful night as the house lay shrouded in darkness. A shadowy figure crept inside. Emily had a bad feeling in her gut. And decided to stay up keeping watch over the house. She heard footsteps and the creaking of the floorboards. It was too late when she realized what was happening. As she rushed to Sarah's room, the door swung open and Eric, with the crazed look in his eyes lunged at her. In the ensuing struggle Emily fought for her life. But Eric was relentless he stabbed her multiple times leaving her bleeding and gasping for breath. Jason, who had been awakened by the commotion, rushed to their aid and was met with the same ruthless violence. Desperation filled the room as Sarah. There would be protector watched and shocked. Unable to intervene. After ensuring that Jason was incapacitated, Eric turned his attention to her. Revealing the full extent of his madness. With chilling precision he set the house on fire. Sealing the fate of his victims. 
as the flames consumed the walls around them. Sarah managed to escape fleeing for her life. She stumbled onto the street screaming for help. Just as the first responders arrived, the firefighters battled the flames, their hoses dousing the inferno. But it was too late for Jason. Severely burned and barely clinging to life, he was rushed to the nearest burn unit, where he endured months of excruciating pain and grueling surgeries. Miraculously, he survived. But his life had been forever altered. The scars on his body were a testament to the horrors he had endured. And the emotional scars ran even deeper. The trauma of that night haunted him every day. And he struggled to find solace and closure. Jason's health deteriorated over time. And he eventually succumbed to his injuries. Leaving behind a profound sense of loss for those who had known and loved him. Emily too had faced a long and arduous recovery, forever marked by the scars both visible and invisible. As for Sarah, she had managed to escape the clutches of her deranged acts, but the ordeal had left her forever changed. She vowed to never let anyone else suffer at the hands of an abuser and dedicated herself to supporting survivors of domestic violence. The tragic events of that night served as a chilling reminder that darkness could infiltrate even the most ordinary of lives, leaving behind a trail of pain, loss and shattered dreams. Emily Jason and Sarah's lives were forever altered. Their futures were rewritten by the cruel hand of fate and the malevolence of one disturbed individual. This is like a day late and not too crazy. But here goes I sold an acoustic bass on CL one time. And I needed the money, so when the guy asked if I could come to him, I agreed I'm a little wary of going to people's houses. So we met at a McDonald's. I'm there and text him what car I'm in and stuff. Behind the McDonald's are some woods. Which six Amish people walk out of into my car. One of them who introduced himself as Daniel gave me the $200 and invited me back to their place for a family concert. I declined, but they insisted on playing for me right there with an acoustic bass mouth harp. Harmonica and one dude just hitting his knees. After that they said bye and walked back into the woods I got some fries and went home. Selling my old 1988 Ford F-150 Custom had been a bittersweet experience. This old truck had been with me through thick and thin. And parting with it was akin to saying goodbye to an old friend. With its odometer clocking in at a whopping 315,000 miles. The old beast had seen better days but it still chugged along like a trooper. The gas gauge had long ceased to function. And one of the gas tank fuel pumps had given up the ghost. But I loved that truck and I hoped to find it a new home. Where it would continue to serve its purpose. I decided to list it on Craigslist. Hoping to find someone who appreciated its rugged charm. The ad described its history. 
Quirks and its character I didn't sugarcoat the issues. I wanted to be upfront about what a potential fire was. Getting into. A few days after posting the ad. I received a response from a guy named Mark. He seemed genuinely interested. So, we arranged a meeting at my place. For him to inspect the truck. He arrived on a bright. Sunny morning with a hint of eagerness in his eyes. We exchanged pleasantries. And he began to inspect the Ford. His eyes roamed over the exterior. Checking for rust. Dents or any other signs of wear and tear. His gaze then settled on the gas gauge. And the switch that controlled. The two fuel tanks I explained the situation. Detailing the issues that I come to accept. As part of the truck's character. Mark listened attentively. And after a few moments of contemplation. Offered $800 for the old F-150. We shook hands and I handed over the keys. Mark hopped into the truck. Started the engine end with a cheerful wave. He drove off down the street. I watched the truck disappear from view. With a mixture of sadness and relief. It was hard to part with it. But I hoped Mark would find as much joy in that old machine. As I had. A week went by. And I had nearly put the old Ford out of my mind. When I received a series of emails from Mark. At first I was excited. Thinking he might have questions. Or wanted to share his experiences with the truck. But as I opened the messages. I was met with a cascade of complaints. Gas gauge doesn't work read one email. How do I switch between tanks? Question another then came the kicker. A fuel pump for one of the tanks doesn't work. I need you to pay for the repairs. I sat there reading the emails. With a mix of bewilderment and frustration. The truck's quirks were not secrets. I had been entirely transparent during the sale. Explaining its issues to Mark. Yet here he was seemingly upset. And demanding compensation. For problems that he was already aware of. For a moment I considered responding to Mark's messages. Explaining once again the condition of the truck. And how the sale had been conducted honestly. But something in me urged against it. I realized that I had upheld my end of the bargain. And Mark's complaints were unjust. I chose not to respond to his messages. Instead deciding to let the situation resolve itself. I hoped that Mark would come to terms with the truck's idiosyncrasies. And find a way to enjoy the old Ford for what it was. A faithful albeit and perfect companion. Weeks turned into months. And I never heard from Mark again. I hoped that he had come to appreciate. The uniqueness of the old. 1988 Ford F-150 custom quirks and all. As I watched the sunset one evening. I couldn't help but feel a sense of closure. The old truck was now part of someone else's story. And I had done my part in ensuring its legacy lived on. For better or for worse. The warm afternoon sun cast a golden glow over the quiet parking lot. Where the Craigslist transaction was about to take place. John had listed his paintball gun. A trusty Tiffany 5 hoping to find a new home for it. 
He received an email from a potential bear. Named Warping 57. Which was intriguing enough to pique his curiosity. As John arrived at the agreed upon location. A sense of anticipation mingled with a hint of nervousness. He sold various items on Craigslist before. But this particular exchange seemed different. It wasn't just about the money. It was about knowing that the paintball gun he loved. And used so much would find a new purpose. As he stepped out of his car, John noticed a man standing near a minivan. With a young boy by his side. The man who appeared to be in his mid-thirties had a friendly smile and an air of approachability about him. The boy who couldn't have been more than ten years old clung to his father's side with wide eyes filled with anticipation. Hey there, John called out. Making his way toward the duo. You must be warping 5-7. The man nodded with a grin. That's me and this little guy right here is my son. Ethan were both excited to get into pain falling. Awesome, John replied. His anxiety dissipating as he saw the father-son duo. It's great to meet you both. I'm John, I'll be right back. I don't have a bag or anything to carry the gun in. Hope that's okay. Warpick 57 nodded in agreement. Sure, take your time. We're not in a rush. John headed back to his car, feeling a mix of relief and excitement. He'd always loved paintball and was thrilled that Ethan would have a chance to share in that enthusiasm with his father. After a quick rummage through the trunk, he grabbed the Tipman A5 and made his way back to the minivan. As he approached, John extended his hand, sealing the deal with a handshake. Here you go, he said, handing over the paintball gun. Treated well. And it'll serve you and your son for years to come. Warping 57 took the gun. And inspected it with a practiced eye. Looks great. We're gonna have a blast with this. John noticed that Warping 57 had reached for his wallet. Which was when he noticed something. That made his heart skip the beat. The wallet was open, just enough for John to glimpse the badge inside. For a few heart-pounding seconds, John's mind raced thoughts of undercover officers. And entrapment danced through his head. He imagined headlines in courtroom dramas. All centered around a simple Craigslist transaction. Panic began to creep in. Warfig 57 must have noticed the change in John's demeanor. He chuckled, withdrawing his wallet to show the badge more clearly. I see you noticed the badge. Yeah, I'm a sheriff in my day job. I'm not here to arrest you. Don't worry. The tension that had gripped John began to dissipate replaced by a nervous laughter. You scared me there for a second. More Big 57 smiled warmly. Sorry about that I should have warned you. I figured this might be a good way for Ethan and me to bond. Especially since I'm not working this weekend. Thanks for understanding. John let out a relieved breath. No problem at all. I hope you and Ethan have a fantastic time out on 
the paintball field be safe and enjoy the adventure. With that the paintball gun found a new purpose. Not in the hands of a criminal, but in the hands of a father and his son, who were looking to create lasting memories together. As they drove off John couldn't help but smile. Grateful that his simple, Craigslist transaction had brought a touch of adventure and a heartwarming connection into his life.